What the fuck is up? Welcome back. My name is Noah Hills. You can find me on Twitter at Noah More Parties. And today's video is a little dive into the best options in redraft leagues for people employing the zero RB strategy. I will explain what that means after the intro. Let's do it. <laughs> Zero RB, you might be familiar, you might not. It's generally a strategy deployed in redraft leagues. I think it's fairly effective in like productive struggle dynasty startups. But we're focusing on redraft leagues today. Um, and basically what zero RB is, is it's a philosophy where you avoid running backs for the first five, six, seven rounds. Hit receiver really hard, hit quarterback, you get an elite quarterback, you get an elite tight end. So you stack your other positions, pick up like high upside, handcuff, you know, pass catching running backs later on in the hopes that like those guys hit increasing the ceiling of your already stacked team because you're loaded at other positions and then you can leverage that increased upside to a championship. You know, whether you think the strategy works, whether you think it's dumb, whatever, it's a viable strategy. It works sometimes if you, you know, do it right, if you pick the right players, if you play the waiver wire the right way. Zero RB can work, and so I'm going to walk through the best zero RB targets in each round of a fantasy draft, starting in round six. Because if you're taking a running back before, like, round six, you're not doing zero RB, you're doing just taking a running back in the mid-round. So, starting round six, I'm using ADP from Sleeper that I got from Fantasy Pros. So... Whatever. But in round six, the current running backs going in round six of redraft leagues are Clyde Edwards Hilaire, Damian Harris, Miles Sanders, Kenneth Walker, and AJ Dillon. And my favorite zero RB target in this round, there's a couple good ones, but my favorite probably is AJ Dillon. And when I'm thinking about a zero RB target, you know, you're not going to end up with Jonathan Taylor. You're not going to end up with Dalvin Cook. You're not going to end up with even like Nick Chubb or Aaron Jones or anybody like that. You're not going to have these guys who are just like absolute no doubt weekly starters with RB1 upside every single week. Those guys are like completely off the table because you've got Justin Jefferson on your team and you've got Travis Kelsey and you know, whoever else you have. So you don't have those high upside running backs. And so the question you have to ask yourself is number one, can this guy start for me early on? And number two, is there some sort of avenue for this guy to just completely smash in fantasy? And for AJ Dillon, the answer to question number one is yes, he can start early on. And the answer to number two is yes, there's an avenue, a, a legitimate avenue, through which he could just end up smashing in fantasy football. And I think it's pretty obvious that he can start for you. He was, you know, a low-key startable asset, especially in the second half of last season. In weeks one through nine last year, he averaged 10 touches per game on a 33% snap share and averaged just under nine fantasy points per game, 8.99 fantasy points per game. Not like the worst player in the league, but not a guy you want in your lineup, really. From weeks 10 through 17, so essentially the second half of the season, this is just in games with Aaron Jones. Aaron Jones missed a couple games. I'm not even counting those. This is just games that Aaron Jones also played in from week 10 through 17. This is six games in the second half of the season with Aaron Jones. A.J. Dillon, during that time period, averaged 16.5 touches per game, up from 10 touches per game in the early half of the season. He had a 47.8% snap share, up from... 33% early on, and he averaged 18.05 fantasy points per game, up from 8.99 fantasy points per game, which that 18.05 is the same points per game that Alvin Kamara averaged through the entire season. So the second half of the year, even in games in which Aaron Jones was playing, A.J. Dillon was producing at an Alvin Kamara level in fantasy football. If Jones goes down, A.J. Dillon is obviously a league winner. He would be like, it would be the A.J. Dillon show in that backfield. But I do think they can coexist as startable assets starting in week one. I also think that A.J. Dillon is going to see some like likely increased opportunities this next season in rushing. Aaron Jones should probably take on more of a receiving role than he has in the past given the departure of Devontae Adams. A.J. Dillon passed Aaron Jones by in like goal line and opportunities for touchdowns within like the 10 and 5 yard lines last season. I would expect that disparity to grow this year given that A.J. Dillon is, is huge. Um, he can he can score touchdowns. And then, like, just by virtue of, like, Devontae Adams leaving and there being more targets to go around, A.J. Dillon continuing to develop as a receiver, he should see more receiving opportunities as well. So I think he'll be better overall than he was last year. I don't expect him to, to produce at an Alvin Kamara level for an entire season, but his opportunities are going to grow. This is going to be an offense that
offense that, that will likely heavily lean on their running back tandem. A.J. Dillon is a great zero RB option round six. Just a second. The cat is meowing. Okay, we're gonna see how this goes with Boris. All right, Boris, say hello. Everyone say hello to Boris. The only running back going in round seven right now in redraft leagues is Kareem Hunt. I'm not super enthusiastic about him, even in a zero RB build, but he's my favorite going in round seven by default because he's the only one going in round seven. The thing with Kareem Hunt and why I'm not that interested is that he just hasn't been very good on a per carry basis, really since his rookie season in Kansas City, and especially since he's been in Cleveland. Although, despite that, despite not being a very good like player on a per carry basis at this point in his career, he did average 19.4 fantasy points per game through week six last season. He then got hurt. Dearness Johnson came in, um, took over that kind of like second running back role behind Chubb, and was just a better runner than Kareem Hunt by far. I think Kareem Hunt is still a quality receiver. They also drafted Jerome Ford. So, you know, I don't know if they're looking to like phase out Kareem Hunt. He's a potential cut candidate. These are more like dynasty related takes though. If he's on the team, you know, through training camp into the preseason, starting week one, I would anticipate him still having a really solid role in this offense. And he's a decent zero RB target because you can probably count on starting him in your fantasy lineups at least early on in the season. In round eight, the guys going there at running back are Cordero Patterson, Devin Singletary, and then my favorite guy going in round eight is Tony Pollard. He is just a good player. We know this. He's an explosive guy. He's a good receiver. He's a dynamic runner. People have been calling for him to get more touches than Zeke Elliott for the last like two or three years. I think that's fairly legitimate, even though Zeke is still like a, you know, He's a reliable guy, but Tony Pollard is clearly more explosive. And last season, he had 10 or more touches in 10 out of the 15 games that he played, and he only had less than nine fantasy points in only two games. So even in his like limited role, he's had like a baseline level of fantasy utility. And with, you know, Zeke's severe decline in rushing efficiency the last couple of years, Zeke's severe decline in just rushing volume in the last couple of years, Amari Cooper's gone, Cedric Wilson's gone, Michael Gallup tore his ACL in January, like, The elite pieces of this offense are just kind of like crumbling right now. CeeDee Lamb is still here, obviously. They drafted Jalen Tolbert. Zeke is healthy. He will be the lead back. But with, you know, kind of the decline there in Zeke's effectiveness, an increase in Tony Pollard's usage in the backfield makes sense. They've talked about using him in the slot more with all these receivers gone. There's possibility for, like, him to get more work, even if Zeke doesn't get hurt this season. But if Zeke goes down, Tony Pollard is, like, a league-winning talent on a good offense that can be had in round eight. Great zero RB target, but everybody else knows that as well. In round nine, the guys going at running back right now are Chase Edmonds, Michael Carter, James Cook, and James Robinson. But my favorite out of these guys is actually Rashad Penny. And the case for Rashad Penny is just that in Seattle, we've seen that like, despite free agent money investments, despite draft capital investments, the best players are going to play. Like they signed Matt Flynn to a big deal back in the day, drafted Russell Wilson in the third round. Russell Wilson was better and he was just the starting quarterback because he's better. They took Rashad Penny in round one back in 2017 or 2018. And then Chris Carson was a, what, seventh round pick from the year before. He played above (laughs) Rashad Penny because he was just better that year. So the best players are going to play in Seattle. Rashad Penny was the best runner in the league on a per carry basis the last six weeks of last season. If he's better than Kenneth Walker in training camp in the preseason, who's to say that he's just not the starting running back? You know, this this could go a lot of different ways. You know, Kenneth Walker could just be the best player in this backfield and he gets all the work. Rashad Penny could be the best player in this backfield and he could get all the work. It could be a true 50-50 split. We don't know, but I think the upside with Rashad Penny is that he just puts Kenneth Walker on the bench and takes over over as the starting running back. He could have early production. Could he get a full workload? What if Kenneth Walker gets hurt? Like the way, the the range of outcomes here is incredibly wide from Rashad Penny being useless to Rashad Penny being a workhorse, but the ceiling is high. This is not going to be a very good offense, but if, if, if he's getting workhorse level touches, which is in play, given what we've seen from Pete Carroll and his like distribution of playing time before, Rashad Penny's a great pick in round nine. A lot of upside there. In round 10, the running backs being taken are Isaiah Spiller, Ramondre Stevenson, Ronald Jones, and Melvin Gordon. And I really like all of these guys from like a zero RB perspective. I really like Ramondre Stevenson, but my favorite of these guys is probably still Melvin Gordon. I could be convinced that Ramondre Stevenson's a better option, but I went with Melvin Gordon here. And I think the, you know, kind of the, the thesis, I guess, of this play is similar to Rashad Penny. You know, they've got Javante Williams, who... A lot of people are assuming will kind of take on more of a role here and not just be the 50-50 split that they saw last season. 
But outside of that, like all of the reasons that we're excited about Javante Williams equally apply to Melvin Gordon. Like they got Russell Wilson. They're going to be a better offense this year. They got a new like offensive minded head coach. They're going to be a better, more efficient offense this season. But Melvin Gordon benefits from that just as much as Javante Williams does. And last year, Melvin Gordon was better on a per carry basis than Javante Williams was by just a little bit. Like what if it's a 50-50 split again? What if Javante Williams gets hurt? Like Melvin Gordon is then going to be the lead back on a Russell Wilson led offense with an offensive minded head coach and a lot of weapons. Like that could be completely wheels up. There is a very high ceiling here. There There's a floor maintained by like Melvin Gordon is just a talented player who has been effective, you know, even at this point in his career, even more effective as a runner last season than Javante Williams was. Javante's a little bit better of a receiver, but you know, there's a path here to like Melvin Gordon starting for you in week one as well, or week two. Maybe you don't want to start in week one. You know, you want to see if Javante Williams is just the guy, but you know, if they split week one, you're going to start Melvin Gordon in week two. And then if anything happens to Javante Williams, or if it shakes out that this is just a 50-50 split again, Melvin Gordon could start for you all season and smash in fantasy football. Several avenues for him to do that. Round 11, the running backs being taken right now are Alexander Madison and Damian Pierce. Madison is obviously, he's been a a key handcuff the last few years, ever since he he entered the league, really, in 2019. Every time Dalvin Cook goes down, he's an RB1 level guy. They added Ty Chandler this offseason. Who knows what their plans are there? Is, Is Madison just like the de facto? workhorse when Dalvin Cook goes down? Is it a split with Ty Chandler now? Who really knows? But Damian Pierce is also being taken in round 11, and he is my favorite between him and Madison because he has a true three-down skill set. You can make a really legitimate argument that he was the best running back in the SEC last year given the ways in which he was like outperforming the efficiency, the consistency of his teammates on a per carry basis in the strongest conference in the country relative to really talented teammates. He was just a really good runner on a per carry basis, underutilized, but really effective. You know, based on his like receiving metrics, he was split out wide often. He was targeted downfield. He was really efficient. He caught a large percentage of his passes. He's right there with James Cook as like the most dynamic receiver among running backs in this rookie class. And he landed on a team with an incredibly weak depth chart, like Rex Burkhead, Marlon Mack is a guy I'm optimistic about, but like he's coming off an Achilles from a couple years ago. Like who knows how effective he is at this point in his career. I don't think Damian Pierce has potential to just completely smash in fantasy. He's one of the guys in this list whose upside is capped by this probably being a little bit of a committee in the backfield, as well as this is just not going to be a very good offense. And that combination probably lowers his ceiling a little bit. So I don't think he can completely smash in fantasy football, but 10 plus touches per game are in play here because of his true three down skill set. There's no reason to take him off the field. Like I, I said, there's a strong possibility this could be a committee, but given how talented I think Damian Pierce is, the odds that he just takes over this backfield, are not completely out of the question. So I think he's a little bit lower upside than a lot of these guys, but his floor could be higher given that I think he has a skill set that allows him to stay on the field really at all times. There's no reason for coaches to like yank him off the field. So my favorite running back in round 12, um, some guys being taken are Rashad White and Tyler Algier. My favorite guy in round 12 is Daryl Henderson. And basically he's been an excellent per carry runner the last two seasons. He was super dynamic his rookie year after being incredibly dynamic at Memphis. But last year and the year before, he was just really consistent on a per carry basis, really efficient on a per carry basis. And he's a dynamic receiver. I'm working on these new receiving metrics that kind of quantify the value of a running back's route tree based on like the expected yards per target of targets on those routes. And Daryl Henderson is running a wide array of routes. The variation in his routes is in the 86th percentile. So he's not just some one trick pony being swung out into the flat and thrown passes like that. Like he's, he's running a lot of different kinds of routes and based on the per target value of those routes, the value of his route tree is in the 76th percentile. So he's running a lot of routes and he's running high value routes. So I think he's really one of the kind of like underrated best receiving running backs in the league. And then there's the problem of Cam Akers, who himself is coming off a torn Achilles and who has never been as effective on a per carry basis as Daryl Henderson has, even when healthy. And so I don't know that I'm willing to, you know, assume that Cam Akers is just a better player than Daryl Henderson is. And so could this be a 50-50 split? Do they want to kind of ease Cam Akers back into things? I know Daryl Henderson is dealing with his own injury issues right now. He needs to get healthy, but he's around 12 pick. So the investment is very small. If this is a 50-50 split, that could be really effective for Henderson, at least seemingly more effective than people are are assuming, given that Cam Akers is being drafted like a lead back. Daryl Henderson is being drafted way back here in Tyler Algier territory, where 
there. Who knows if Algier even sees the field. And so if this is a 50-50 split, Daryl Henderson is going to make good on this ADP. If Akers just isn't good to go, if Akers gets hurt again, this could be the, the Daryl Henderson show. So there's a lot of upside here on one of the best offenses in the league for Daryl Henderson, who has a three down skill set. My favorite running back going in round 13 is the only running back currently going in round 13, and that's Naeem Hines. And he was the PPR RB 15 in 2020, was like the PPR RB 38 or something last year after they like way downsized his receiving involvement. But he's one of the best receiving running backs in the league, and all we need is more work. And the chatter from Indianapolis, you know, this offseason is they is that they want to get him more involved. Last season, they had Carson Wentz, who's not a check down thrower. This dude's just a, a don't give a fuck quarter back who's going to scramble or chuck it downfield. He's not looking for Naeem Hines, you know, in the flat, in in the curl area um, for, for check down routes when he's in trouble. He's making stupid decisions, bombing it downfield. Now they have Matt Ryan, who's much more stylistically like Philip Rivers, prone to checking down, making smart decisions with the ball. He's not, you know, r- running around there with his head cut off like Carson Wentz was. They want to get Naeem Hines more work. They now have a quarterback that's conducive to getting Naeem Hines more work. I don't think he's going to be the RB15 like he was in 2020, but he has weekly starter potential here in round 13. In round 14, the guys being taken are J.D. McKissick, Raheem Mostert, and Marlon Mack, but my favorite of these guys is Kenneth Gainwell. I talked about him in a video a couple weeks ago, but he was an absolutely terrible runner last year by almost any objective measure after being an excellent runner in his only season with a lot of work in college at Memphis in 2019. Add to that, add to his like hypothetical value as a runner that we didn't see last year, add to that is that he had the number one hog rate among running backs in 2020. And hog rate is targets per route run. So while he didn't have a large snap share, he wasn't on the field a ton, he had 50 targets. He was being targeted more per route than any running back in the entire league And then the case with this depth chart is that Miles Sanders, the main guy, has been underwhelming, especially as a receiver throughout his career. But even as a runner, he's not been consistent. He's not like a reliable between the tackles runner. He's got some athletic juice and able to do things out in space. But Miles Sanders is an underwhelming player. Boston Scott is not as dynamic as Kenneth Gainwell. And Gainwell had five startable weeks last season in fantasy, despite only having two games with above a 50% snap share. So if he runs better, he could play more. And if he plays more, he was already useful in fantasy for a couple weeks last Last year, if he plays more and maintains this, you know, he doesn't have to have the number one hog rate in the league last year, but he's one of the best receiving running backs in the league. That's more targets. He could run a little bit better. I could see him, you know, it's not out of the realm of possibility. He just takes over this backfield, becomes the number one runner here, and is, you know, smashing that round 14 ADP. In round 15 and beyond, there's guys like Keontae Ingram, Tyrion Davis-Price, Sony Michelle are some of my favorite guys, but my favorite guy going outside of round 14 in redraft leagues right now is Khalil Herbert. And basically the case for him is that he was absolutely fantastic on a per carry basis last year after being absolutely fantastic on a per carry basis at Virginia Tech as a fifth year senior. And before that was absolutely fantastic on a per carry basis as a fourth year guy at Kansas. So we've now seen him in three different situations on three different teams smash on a per carry basis. Like the proof is there that this guy is just a quality runner. He's proved it in three different situations now. And last year when David Montgomery went down, he averaged 21.8 touches per game without Montgomery and 16.2 fantasy points per game without Montgomery. He's like an Alexander Madison level handcuff who's being taken far later than Alexander Madison. He's one of the best handcuffs in the league. If David Montgomery goes down, Khalil Herbert is a weekly starter, and maybe they start phasing Herbert in a little bit more with Montgomery, given how effective he was last season. So those are my guys, Khalil Herbert, Kenny Gainwell, Naeem Hines, Daryl Henderson, Damian Pierce, Melvin Gordon, Rashad Penny, Tony Pollard, Kareem Hunt, AJ Dillon. Get them on your team. Fuck running backs in round one through five. Take these guys and win your leagues. Thanks for watching the video. Like, subscribe, leave a comment, follow me on Twitter. Have a great rest of your week and a great weekend. Peace.